It's been about a year since I last talked about using loops and samples in production music, and I'll put a link up there for you. But I've been writing a lot of hip hop for sports broadcasting lately, and it has unearthed this entire conversation. I've been talking to fellow composers, and I've even gone through and revisited some of the submission guidelines for the libraries I write for, and, and I think we need to talk about Splice. And <laughs> I'm worried that, that I might be in trouble. So we're gonna talk about that, as well as listen to an epic orchestral cue written by a member of the 52 Cues community on this week's episode of the 52 Cues podcast. What is happening, everybody? This is Dave Croft, and welcome back to another episode of the 52 Cues podcast. Uh, what is 52 Cues? Well, we are a diverse community of composers and producers devoted to writing better production music through lifelong learning, mutual support, and encouragement to others along their journey, starting and focusing on just writing one cue per week. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you so much for finding me however you found me. Before we get started, I definitely want to give a special word of thanks to my Patreon patrons whose support helps keep things going here. Lots more about my Patreon at the end of the video. Uh, so like I said, we're going to be talking about Splice today, and I'm also going to be featuring a cue called Greens by Pranav G, who is a member of the 52 Qs community. That's coming up a little bit later. If you want to, you can uh, skip over any portion of the video by checking out the timestamps in the description below. But I, I wanted to spend today, and admittedly, I'm just going to tell you on the front end, this might come off as a little ranty. So uh, just, I guess, I guess buckle up <laughs> because I feel like we need to talk about, we need to talk about Splice. I've, I've long since talked about using loops and samples and the TLDR is loops and samples are safe. Well, legally obtained loops and samples are safe to use as long as you're not incorporating identifiable uh, melodic or harmonic uh, uh, loops that could potentially trip up content ID systems. Typically, drum loops, those types of things are okay because they they tend not to uh, to get identified by the uh, the master algorithm. But anything that is melodic, uh, vocal, anything that's like a chord progression where you just lay it in, loop it, don't do any manipulation, tends to run into some issues, which is all well and good. And I talked about that previously. But I feel like Splice, which is just unapologetically my loop and sample provider of choice. It's uh, I don't use like Loop Galaxy. I've tried sounds.com from Native Instruments, but I use Splice because the interface is, is, is great and uh, it's super easy to use and bringing samples in and they have plugin that, that goes into your DAW and makes that a lot easier. So I just use Splice and I've been subscribed for years. I have like 5,000 credits, you know, that I, that I, that I have available. And so, so I feel like anytime I need a certain sound, a certain effect, a riser, a sweep, an 808, if I need some, something that I know that I either can't produce on my, my own, if it's a vocal chop or something, or don't necessarily have time to produce on my own because it would bog the system down, then I turn to splice specifically and especially in hip hop. And I, and I write quite a bit of hip hop, ranging from kind of epic orchestral hip hop to dramedy hip hop to urban contemporary hip hop. That sounds like it's pretty much ripped straight from the radio. But here is what I'm running into with, specifically with Splice. And I feel like they are getting unfairly maligned or lumped in to some of these other other bad actors in in the the sample space, and like I said, I, I saw it in one of my library guidelines, a library that I've published with. I've I've been with them for years, and 
just this week, I went back into their guidelines and they specifically said, don't use splice or don't use uh, loop aggregators such as splice. And then they named some other ones. And I felt that was a little unfair. Now, there are a couple of things going on here. The first is the the problems that arise when a library looks to publish a queue that contains loops and samples. It can trip up content ID and cause all kinds of headaches for attributing who whose queue this actually is because the algorithm is just looking you know, at a wave form and sees this recognizable chunk of audio data and says, this is from this composer. And so the copyrights and royalties and everything are gonna get fed over to this composer, composer A and not composer B. So that's, that's, that's the, the real first problem and the understandable issue that I know libraries have by incorporating loops and samples. So that's that's one thing. But I feel like Splice is getting kind of lumped in to these other, like I said, bad actors who are, are, aren't really operating within kind of the legal boundaries of where it needs to. You know, I feel like I feel like Splice is getting kind of lumped into like Napster territory or Kazaa or all of MP3, where you might, this is what I think some people's perception of Splice is. They think that even though you pay, ultimately you're dealing with sounds which aren't 100% original and you might not, uh, they might have been uploaded to Splice nefariously. Splice is 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 pretty transparent about their upload process and they make sure that 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 the sounds that they have are are legit. And from everything that I've seen and I've even explored uploading my own sounds to Splice, it, you can't just willy-nilly, is that a thing anybody says? You can't just arbitrarily just dump a bunch of sounds and call them your own. They're they're pretty transparent about their process and using copyrights. Can we use it in, in all of that? Where I think Splice got into trouble is when a video came out or it, it came to the attention that a producer named Kashmir, I'm, I'm assuming K-S-H-M-R, uh, Kashmir incorporated the sound of Mick Gordon's Doom soundtrack or some sounds from Mick Gordon's Doom. And so so check this out. And this and and that is Rip and Tear from the Doom soundtrack by Mick Gordon. Now, Mick went on to kind of get loose on Twitter and said, "Hey, Things aren't cool here. Sounds like you've ripped off my stuff. And then things got really haywire. Twitter sphere erupted. The Reddit sphere erupted. And suddenly people start, you know, putting out, uh, putting out videos like this. It starts getting caught, caught up by, uh, by news aggregates, EDM uh, blogs, and things start going really sideways really fast. Now, Kashmir immediately responded to Mick Gordon's claim. Mick has since deleted those the the Instagram and tweets about it, and has has uh, has accepted the apology from Kashmir. Okay, guys. Hey, so wow, there's a lot to say here. Um, man, uh, first of all. Mick Gordon is a legend. Uh, I got obsessed with his soundtrack for Doom over the last year or so, and I really did design the whole industrial grime folder in my pack around it. Uh, the goal was to recreate the sounds, uh, process, and uh, you know arrange melodies and pitch, and uh, you know to give the same feel but not to be identical. Um, however. 
watching Mick's video, I agree with him. Um, some of those sounds are just too similar and that's, that's not okay. Um, and I am, I, I'm, I am sorry about that. And, uh, if, if, if Mick likes, I'm down to uh, send all the proceeds of that folder, uh, to him, uh, or we can just take them down. Um, but, uh, you know, I hope you know, Mick, this, this was done, you know, in admiration of you. That really is the truth. And, uh, I did reach out to you personally. So yeah, just let me know. And again, I'm sorry for, uh, for this whole thing. All right. And so they have taken it down. I, I think it's still down. They, they took it down immediately and Mick accepted the apology has taken down any reference to it. So you can't find anywhere, or, or at least I couldn't find any reference to Mick Gordon having made this claim. Now, now, what has happened now is this has become the poster child for Splice being in a marketplace for illegally obtained samples. And I've seen it pop up in forums. Don't use Splice. They steal people's art, artwork. They steal samples. That's from anything that I have found. That is just false. It's just not true. And if you know of any other example where Splice has willfully and continues to upload and sell illegally obtained samples, please let me know. Because if, if Splice is a crappy company, I don't want any part of them. I'll let my 5,000 credits go away. But, and I don't work for Splice. I'm not sponsored by Splice. I'm not about to tell you to, to pop this code into and get 10% off. None of that. I just... It's kind of like with, 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 with taxi, like you have to understand what's up and you have to, to kind of set your, your internet cynicism aside and look at the, the, the kind of the facts here. And, 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 and I'm seeing splice kind of get unfairly maligned and getting swept up into this Napster froth of, 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 of we can't use it. And so to see or to talk to composers working with libraries and seeing libraries being okay with other sample packs, with other companies, but putting Splice alongside those, those internet vacuum sites, which admittedly do not vet. It's just a repository of WAV files. You have no idea where they came from, and that's really crummy. And I tell my students all the time, do not incorporate samples into your into your your tracks that you did not legally obtain. But for everything that I can see, Splice is, is doing their 100% due diligence in how they get their loops and their samples. This one instance, this one instance has like tainted Splice. And I don't think that's necessarily fair. There, there was also this other issue where Justin Bieber was getting, like a, a Justin Bieber song was getting called out for copyright infringement. And it turns out it was a splice loop. Legally obtained. I mean, using loops and samples is nothing new. I've, I've been sitting in a movie theater watching like the little pre-roll kind of quiz and everything. And I'm like, hey, that's, that's an Apple loop right there. I've seen like Apple loops show in, in like TV commercials. So it's using sp splice, using loops and samples is one thing. How libraries uh, tackle using loops and samples is one thing. But to put splice in the same category as those other sites, I think is really, really unfair. Now, I, I would... Love to hear your thoughts. I'd love to to kind of to hear from, especially if you're a library, if you're a publisher, because I know it's challenging for you. But the next train coming down the tracks, once we get on the other side of figuring out Splice, is 
all of these sample, uh, these plugin makers from Spitfire, Heaviosity, 8DO, in any of these, these libraries, sample makers, I'm, I'm using the same term, but, but you know, contact instruments or, or whatever that have loops baked into them, that's what's next, guys. That is the next frontier of tackling this issue. You have East West Composer Cloud and you have Silk, the Silk Library. And there are some like some, some Duduk samples or, or, or some, um, some uh, Gujang uh, licks. And you incorporate them in. You have Heaviosity's Vocalese. I love Vocalese. It sounds amazing. It sounds like ripped straight out of the Gladiator soundtrack. But you put those vocal samples into your queue, you're going to be in the exact same problem. The algorithm sees no difference from the, the an, an, analytical wave data of a sample purchased from Splice as the wave data from a sample dropped in to, from a plugin by Heaviosity. The algorithm, if that's the issue, if the issue is the algorithm, then the algorithm sees no difference. But Splice is becoming this punching bag. Now here, I, I told you it was going to be ranty. Here is where I, I'm worried. I'm worried for myself. And it, and it has to do with what I talked about uh, with my Serato sample. My Serato sample video where, and I'll put a link to that as well. Uh, my Serato sample video where I talked about, you know, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. And if you are looking to create authentic hip hop, then you've, you've got to use the tools and techniques that hip hop producers use. And that is unapologetically loops and samples. And just this week, as I've been mulling this over, just been kind of chewing on, on not the legal ramifications, but the, the library algorithmic ramifications, I've been thinking, how, how would I accomplish this? How would I accomplish the sound of a, of a vocal chop? How would I accomplish the sound of, of, of a, a, a 19th century brass band? How would I accomplish some of these, these sounds in my cues if I were looking to create all of that from scratch? And it begs the question, is that, is that what libraries are expecting? Libraries who publish authentic contemporary hip-hop cues, are you expecting producers to craft all of those sounds from scratch. And not just like 12, sound, 12 tracks a year because you're just creating one album a year, but we're expected to make hundreds of cues. When I, when I get uh, you know, contracted to write an album of cues, you know, it's 10 to 15 tracks. So is a library expecting me to craft all of those sampled type sounds from scratch. And if so, I, I'm not, I'm not sure I can do that. I'm not sure. I'm not sure I have that breadth of, uh, of well, finances. If I'm like hiring people to come over and record into my studio or, or hiring, you know, brass players or, or those types of things, or, the, the, the depth of, of samples like uh, plugins to create all that or the time. And so I've been really, really struggling this week as I've been writing cues using samples, which are all chopped up, right? I, I am clearly like outside of algorithm issues, right? I'm not just taking a vocal sample, dropping it in and calling it mine. It really is the my approach to using loops and samples in hip hop is the stained glass maker. I get the piece, I hammer the 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 the, the glass 
it, it breaks into a ton of pieces and then I create something new because that is intrinsic to how hip hop is and was produced. And if you want that hip hop sound, if you want your track to sound like brass blats from a, a, a sampler, you can't just load up your brass library. Otherwise, that's going to sound like an orchestra sitting in your hip hop track. It needs to sound like an orchestra recorded in the 1930s, resampled into your hip hop track. To be honest, those types of things that those aren't aren't a problem for me. Like I I I can get my brain around it. It's some of the really like vocal usage, some some of these live players, you know. To, to, to do like funk bass or funk guitar. That's like, I, I can't make my brain leap over that. And I think, I think libraries are expecting me to do that. I think if you're a library, I'd love to hear from you. And I'd love to hear about your experiences with specifically publishing hip hop and like what you've run into with uh, content ID issues, with the understanding that your composers are chopping, manipulating, doing the things that hip hop producers do. Just last night, we wrote a hip hop cue and I approached it the same way a, a traditional hip hop producer would approach writing a beat which is what I call crate diving. You go through your record collection and you start listening and mining for, for nuggets that are sparking a creative idea that you can, you can like, oh, I can twist and manipulate this and create something new out of it. And so it was going through splice, auditioning sounds, thinking, huh, that quarter note from that bass line, I can load into a sampler Stretch, manipulate, reverse, repitch, stretch, slow down, and create a brand new bass line in a different key, completely different rhythm, and all of that. And that is capturing that sampled sound. But how, how do I do that? How, how do I get to, be, to the point where I can produce those authentic sounding hip hop tracks? and yet not use loops or samples. I would love to hear your thoughts. I, I am earnestly asking for your input there because it, it, it is a slippery slope. And I do, I do understand and empathize with where libraries are coming from. I get it. Content ID has, has, is a blessing and a curse. You can find tracks that you that were were broadcast from across the world that you never knew, and then you can go to try to track down royalties. But on the other hand, it's it's causing all kinds of headache because you're getting false positives. Heck, I was doing a live stream uh, a few months ago, and I got done, and I got a copyright notice, not a flag, not a strike against the channel, but a copyright notice saying. This has been demonetized and uh, any royalties or, or ad revenue is going to this composer. And I didn't listen to anything. It just so happened that the drum part I was writing, I was using damage, I think, damage from heaviosity. The drum part just happened to be similar enough to trip a content ID flag in YouTube, even though I was writing it from scratch on the keyboard using MIDI. And to be honest, that, that was a little scary because what's like, what's to stop, uh, what's to stop all these false positives from, from, from completely undoing everything with a track that I'm writing and the drum part just happened to sound like the drum part from another cue who prop or another track or a song or whatever, who probably used damage and used a similar rhythm. So what are your thoughts? If you're a hip hop producer, I want to hear from you. I want to hear how you're using uh, or how you're, you're sidestepping this loops and sample challenge. And if you're a library, I certainly want to hear from you. And if you think I just need to 
suck it up and get good or get better, uh, then uh, you can tell me that too. Let me know in the comments below. Uh, but I, I am, I'm really kind of at an impasse, and it, it was, it was sobering to see like splice show up specifically in the guidelines and to hear it from another composer that they're working with libraries who specifically call out splice. So again, I'd love to know your thoughts. Please let me know in the comments below. So let's now change gears. We're going to listen to a cue called Greens, uh, written by a member of the 52 Qs community. His name is Pranavji. And he says, here's my orchestral-based cue track. It's still under progress, uh, needs more unified strings and a little mixing. And so this is Greens. All right, right out of the gate, uh, right out of the gate, I feel like uh, I, I feel like that timpani roll kind of led to nothing. Right, so that was kind of big, and then there was a weird kind of pullback. If you're going to do that timpani roll, make sure that it, that it connects solidly to the downbeat. And you have kind of maybe like a boom, a big impact or a grand casa, a big concert bass drum, but it seemed kind of uh, and then nothing. I would probably bring it down in the mix and connect connect that roll. As as I'm listening to it, it sounds like a, a tom roll into a timpani hit. So I would do just a timpani roll if you're going to keep that. I'm not even sure you need it. I think you could start with just the timpani notes. Nice build. It does sound a little dark. And I know you, you recognize that the, the mix needs a little bit, little bit of work. Nice. Let's back that up a little bit. Those trumpet hits are those those brass are those uh like sforzandos, sforzandi. If you're gonna hit it, back it off, and make sure it really really pops through the mix. Nice. Yeah, I feel like we have a gang up around five or 600 hertz or so. I would go into your EQs and isolate some of those so that uh, so that it's not all kind of building up. And that's really easy to do with these epic drums. Uh, you get a lot of attack, but you also get a ton of low end. And that uh, that that 300 to, to, to 1K or so, that gets really ganged up. And that's where a lot of instruments tend to live anyway, especially with these types of big orchestral sounds. That's where a lot of the cello tone is. That's where like some of your lower viola is, is in those low mids. And so that's where it feels like it's really ganging up right now. And, and I know for a fact that isolating these big drums, specifically if you're using damage or something similar, storm drum, uh, action strikes can be really challenging. So I would spend some time doing that. I feel like there needed to be another another gear of energy here, and 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 this 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 cue feels somewhere kind of in between like a, a production music cue and a trailer track, and so with your edit points with your edit points I'm going to approach this more as a as a trailer type of a thing, uh, because trailers really have these 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 very clearly defined act structures, and I kind of see an act one act two. Act three with a denouement. That's kind of what it feels like. And so because of that, you need to make sure that there is very clear gradations of energy as the cue progresses throughout. Three, two, four. I would add something up. 
I would add another layer. I know you went to a different harmonic change there. There's that layer. Good, nice. Uh, I would, depending on what, what horn library you're using, I would massage the, uh, massage the legato transitions if you can. It's sounding, those are one of the key like giveaways uh, of, of MIDI horns and really any MIDI, MIDI acoustic instrument is that the transition between notes. And so uh, you could you could do this by kind of overlapping. If you don't have specific uh, legato uh, options, you can ov overlap the notes. Uh, I'm trying to do my hands where I'm not covering the mic. Uh, you can overlap those notes so that they blend a little bit more. This is one of the reasons I love uh, Cinebrass two horn ensemble. Is the legato transitions sound so realistic? They sound so good. And uh, Vienna Symphonic woodwinds, their clarinet and oboe. Uh, legato transitions are gold. Two, three. I don't know if I would do a chord change here. I would, I would keep it, keep it the same. If we're thinking trailer. I think those bump, bump, bump. I think those could pop out. Definitely need more transient energy in your drums. This this needs to be a, a little bit more aggressive. Right, right here, leading into this uh, this little moment, this edit moment. John, 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 and look at adding some Colenio hits. Colenio, if you're not familiar with it, is uh, is when when string players strike the strings with the the uh, the back of the bow, and so you, you get a you know whole bass section slapping <laughs> slapping the uh, the the strings with their with their bow uh, or the with the wooden end of their bow, and it's just this clack sound, which I know you've heard. I even if you can't kind of identify the name of it, I promise you you have heard this, and that clack 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 could be really really effective. Okay, so um, we have kind of our, our big ending. If this is three act structure, this middle section, this act three needs to be longer and needs to be much louder. Three, four, and I don't know if I would end on tonic here. Oh, that's on tonic. I, I like I like all the string swells and everything. It's just it 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 leads to nothing. I think this gap is too long. And then we've gone somewhere totally new. And we've introduced synthetic sounds, synth pulses. I like the synth pulse. If you want that, introduce it much earlier. Uh, a minute 22 is a little, little late to introduce brand new textures like this, considering the form that we've had leading up to this point. I like that chord change. And uh, I would end the strings on tonic. It sounds like they're... Uh, uh, sounds like it ends on the fifth. Ooh, ooh. All right, so uh, if this were a trailer track, trailer structures and... Um, and have your, your your trailer structures pretty much in the act, uh, act breaks. And I would I would bring in something a little bit more melodic here at the beginning. And you want to kind of hint at what's coming. I think that's a good build. I feel like it, it's a little anemic on the other side of this. And this, this sounds like a different type of cue. I mean, it's in the same key, it's related, I can hear, but this sounds like the B section 
to a four minute cue or something much longer. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not sure, it just, the, the, character, the character of the cue has changed at that point. Again, if you're thinking in trailer terms, if you're thinking of kind of your, your tension type of cue, then, then we're okay here. But this, uh, the break at uh, minute 17, minute 20, that's, that's way too long. That's uh, way too long. But I do appreciate you sending this, uh, sending this my way and submitting that over to the 52 Qs community. The last thing I will say is the, uh, the title. T title needs a little love. I'm not sure greens is descriptive. One word titles in general, uh, I, I try to avoid because it's a it's hard to find a one word title that hasn't been used. And B, it's tough to find one word that is descriptive enough to capture the attention of a music supervisor as they are scrolling through a giant list of cues. So I'm not sure the term greens, I don't know if it's just a placeholder placeholder track, but uh, but it feels a little like what I would call this Again, if you're thinking like trailer, like uh, like journey, journey to the earth, or something, I don't, I don't know. Uh, but I do appreciate you sending that our way. Like I said, uh, this track was submitted over into the Fifty Two Qs Facebook group specifically for our week seven submissions. We do take submissions every single week, and it's part of what we do here at 52Qs. You can join the community by heading over to 52Qs.com, and there is uh, somebody right right there uh, answering and posting up. If you, uh, if you have cues that you would like feedback for, or if you want to leave feedback for others, head over to 52Qs.com and join in on the community. But that's going to do it for me today. Uh, I do want to give a, another special word of thanks to my Patreon patrons whose support helps keep this channel going. So if you like what I do here, don't thank me, thank them. In addition to keeping things going on the channel, those Patreon, uh, Patreon patrons are helping some other really exciting things be possible coming up that I can't wait to talk to you about, about the 52 Qs community. So absolutely stay tuned. Uh, to be a patron, it's just $1 a month and you not only get the satisfaction of supporting you know, a fellow composer, but you also get access to my weekly music production live streams. We just uh, worked on a hip hop cue last night. We will be finishing it up uh, next week. And I start with the blank DAW and go to mix and master. So if that's something that's interesting to you, check me out at patreon.com slash Dave Croft. If you're not interested in that, that's cool too. If you just wanna come and, uh, and receive, that is also cool. Another thing I want I want to mention is uh, if you enjoyed that feedback and that's something that you want beyond the 52 Qs experience, I do offer that as a service. I don't really talk about it much, but I do offer uh, custom feedback, video feedback, private lessons, and all of that. And uh, those links will be downstairs, <laughs> downstairs in the description. But that's going to do it for me today. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope that you had a great week uh, eight, and I look forward to seeing you next time. Until then, peace. The 52 Cues podcast is copyright 2022, Dave Croft, all rights reserved. The music played on the podcast is copyright of their respective owners and is used for educational purposes only. For more information, including joining the 52 Cues community and submitting your cue for consideration on the podcast, head over to 52Cues.com. <laughs>